Good evening and welcome to tonight's Public Safety Forum. Tonight is the fourth of a series of Public Safety Forums hosted by Madam Mayor uh, Stephanie Rawlings-Blake. Uh, before we get started uh, with the Q&A, there are a few folks that I would like to introduce to you, but first I would like to welcome Rabbi Phil Miller, uh, who is the director of the JCC. If he would just please join us at the podium and give an official welcome. Thanks so much, Gus. Good to see everyone here this evening. Uh, I'm uh, one of the vice presidents of the Jewish Community Center. And uh, on behalf of the Jewish Community Center, we are very uh, honored and proud to, to host this gathering uh, this evening. The, the, Jewish, the Jewish Community Center has been a great stakeholder and part of Baltimore City for well over 100 years. And we've been here at this, this place in this neighborhood since the late 50s uh, and look to be here for many, many decades to come as a strong part of, uh, thanks, thanks, Councilwoman, as a strong part of this, uh, of, of this, wonderful, this wonderful community. Um, and and uh, it is in that spirit of, uh, of our participation in the community that we uh, were more than happy to host uh, this evening's forum, and we are honored to have our 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 two uh, our, our two uh, special guests and everyone else who is here. And uh, if anyone would like to, uh, to come and and visit our JCC or take a tour of our JCC, whether tonight or any other time, we would uh, we would love to uh, love to meet you and uh, and uh, show you our facility. Thanks again for being here and. Uh, and again, we are honored to be hosting this evening. Thanks again. Also, I would like to present to you the president of the CRC here in Northwest Baltimore, uh, Miss Ride Out Howard. Please put your hands together and welcome her. Good evening, everyone. So glad, first off, to see so many of us here that have come out for this event to really work on the safety of our community, our city, and our state. It does cover and across. For the Northwest, those of you that don't know, the Northwest District Community Relation Council meets on the fourth Thursday, I'm sorry, on the fourth Tuesday of every month at the police district. We come together in order to enhance the, and the understanding of working with the police department so that we can communicate citizens to the department to know what's going on in our areas. We also come together because we want to combat the crime, the deterioration, and the unhealthiness that's in our community even though we're basically working with the police department to try and help on that aspect, we also want to take into consideration our living conditions. Public safety covers health, environment, housing, any type of problems that you might have. As I said before, um, we give out information, we take in information, we hold classes so that you, oops, so that you can learn directly what to do in your community to help you out. I can be reached at 443-934-1347. Please come out and join us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rodout Howard. Uh, now I would like to present, certainly not introduce to you, but present uh, two uh, people who represent uh, districts in the Northwest Police District. One we call the Dean of the Council, uh, and that is none other than Councilwoman Ricky Spector. And she will be joined on the podium by Councilwoman Sharon Middleton. You will both come to the podium at this time. We call her the baby girl. <laughs> and it's her birthday. And she's 21 again. Now we need a thorn between the roses 
Councilman Brandon Scott, he's a native. He comes from this part of town, even though he doesn't represent. Please join us. <laughs> I'm just going to say a few words. I want to thank you all for coming. I always say that the mayor is the daughter I didn't have. I'm soon going to have to say the commissioner is the son that I didn't have. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate your coming out. Uh, Madam Mayor, Commissioner, you're competing with about five major events in our neighborhood tonight. It's a special holiday, Yom Ha'atzma'ot. So many synagogues are celebrating, and there's a gubernatorial debate over on the west side of our district, but you're number one. You're number one. <laughs> I give greetings also, and thank you for uh, uh, having or using these facilities. Um, I do see that we have some uh, participants from Southern Park Heights, so we, we definitely hope that, this, that the questions and answers come from and represent both sides of the Park Heights community. It's, um, it's a growing community, and we all want to continue to work together and, and live together and play together. Well, who says you can't come home again? Uh, I just want to say on behalf of being the vice chairman of the Public Safety Committee that the committee fully supports, uh, we know that Councilwoman Milton is on the committee, but we support your efforts. Uh, even though I don't represent Park Heights anymore, I'm still here. My whole entire family outside of me still live in Park Heights, so I'm here at least once a day. Sometimes I don't go home, but just don't tell the people in my district that. <laughs> but we just want to say I'm happy to see so many people out here again today. And lastly, uh, Ricky Spector taught me everything I know. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman Scott. I was actually going to let the uh, mayor make reference to you, but it's good to see you home again, sir. Uh, a former uh, employee of the mayor's office of neighborhoods, so it's always good to be with Councilman Scott. Next up, I would like to present to you uh, the mayor of this very fine city, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is a pleasure for me to be here with all of you. Thank you. I, I am fully aware that we are competing against several other events this evening, and I'm very grateful that you've decided to spend some time with me. I want to thank the council representatives for being here. Uh, I will start with the dean of the city council, Ricky Spector. Uh, every, Ricky often says everyone needs an Oscar in their life, uh, but I would say everyone needs a Ricky. Um, I am very, very grateful uh, for uh, the relationship that I've, I've had with you. Uh, Ricky has been a, a very loyal supporter and uh, the type of supporter that if you want to be better, you need in your corner because she'll tell you when you're doing well. And I think any of you who have known her for more than five minutes knows that she'll also tell you when you're not. And um, I think that is a, a very useful a uh, useful uh, thing. It, it's certainly been to me, so thank you very much, Ricky, uh, for your uh, steadfast support and your willingness to work for uh, your constituents. Uh, the, to the birthday girl, uh, Councilwoman Middleton, yeah, I, she, she learns uh, from her office mate, her, her next door neighbor, uh, Ricky Spector, that the, the way to, thing, to get things done is to be a tireless advocate, and I want to thank you for working so hard for your entire district. You know, the, the, the sign of a, of a good uh, council person is that every neighborhood thinks that, uh, that they're your favorite, and I think that um, when uh, the advocacy that uh, Councilwoman Middleton does on behalf of each of the neighborhoods has everyone thinking that, um, you know, that they're, she's like Willard Scott. She's like, this is the best city and, you know, the best neighborhood in the, in the whole city. Uh, <laughs> see? And, and to Councilman Scott, thank you for coming to this uh, public safety forum and so many others. Uh, your, your commitment to uh, making sure that the, the council is uh, a, a full partner in our efforts to make Baltimore safer is much appreciated. So thank you for all of your work. To the CRC president, I was trying to think if you were, the, um, you were one of the, the first community members I worked with. Um, as a uh, council member, so, uh, you know, it's been a long, long, long time since 95. 
Yeah, but like as a council member, yes. you were one of the first. Don't don't start, Councilman <laughs> Scott. <laughs> you know what's funny? He's he'll find out very shortly. All of you who are over forty, you know, he finally turned thirty, and now you know <laughs> he will find that the, the time between you know the th between you know birth and thirty seems like a lifetime. Between thirty and forty. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? So keep laughing. You're going to wake up, your knees going to hurt. In fact, you'll feel it. And then I'll say, I told you. So I want to thank your CRC president for being, you know, for as long as I can remember in my public life, being an, a staunch advocate for this community and a, as much as a relentless advocate, you are a committed partner. So, so thank you for that. And everybody I mentioned who was here, I want to thank Commissioner Batts for being here and Commissioner, I mean, and Chief Ford. Where's my fire chief? Right in the, in, uh, the back here. Please stand up so everybody can see you. <laughs> chief Niles Ford. I could not be more proud of my uh, fire chief. Uh, he, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I interviewed for when I interviewed the commissioner and the fire chief is their commitment to the community and, and, and making sure that, uh, that the uh, community had a place, whether it was in the fire department or the police department. And with respect to uh, Chief Ford, I mean, you're everywhere. Uh, you are in, in uh, neighborhoods all over our city. Uh, make sure that people understand the resources that are available, whether it's, you know, calling 311 for a free smoke detector. Uh, or the, the uh, fire safety checks, or the work that you're doing to, to uh, make sure that we have a, uh, what he likes to refer to as a farm team for the fire department by making sure that we are creating a real pathway from our high schools into uh, the very uh, proud tradition and the uh, proud career of the fire department. I just wanna thank you uh, for all of uh, your leadership. All right, so I, I, I know my staff is kill, looking at me like, um, stop talking because I've used up my time, but I just wanna say uh, this is about making sure that we have, uh, we give you an opportunity uh, to discuss our public safety uh, strategy. We wanna figure out um, you know, the, what's working, what's not working. Uh, I have a, a strategy that has worked uh, that is it's, uh, focusing on violent repeat offenders. Uh, we know that that strategy works. It is how we've been able to re significantly reduce the homicide rate. We've been able to significantly reduce violence in the city. I still believe we can do better, and that's why we are having this conversation. And I know that we can do better when we work together with the community. I've been very proud uh, that we have been able to increase the number of uh, information we get from citizens. Last year, the increase was over 300%. And that tells me that um, just as I heard uh, when I was um, you know, talking to community members all over the, the city prior to bringing Commissioner Batson, that every community, no matter you know, what part of the city, they want it, you, you want to be partners and full partners in making our city safer. And by having these forums, being able to hear from you, being able to get feedback, we can uh, ensure that we are being better partners together. So I wanna thank you all for coming out in when we do the question and answer I'll be able to talk a little bit more about some of the initiatives that we are bringing but I know that I went over my time and I just want to thank you again for coming out I look forward to hearing from you and please put your hands together and welcome Commissioner Anthony Batts that you're here. The mayor said that uh, she, didn't want, she didn't want to take up too much time. She's the mayor. She can take as much time as she wants. So uh, I will yield my time to her Commissioner, very quickly. Yes, sorry, sir. man. You know I did not I cut you off. I to speak on that because the TV cameras are Yes, sir. <laughs> so he knows that's the first. I won't cut you off, but we need to get your audio. So thank you, Can sir. I, is Please. this okay? Yes, sir. Hi, Jay. I hate these things. I like to walk around in audiences. It keeps, keeps me in one place. Uh, very quickly. One of the things that I, I am most proud of is uh, my command staff and, and the police officers and the men and women who work diligently every day at doing their jobs. So I never hesitate to shake hands of my officers when I see them. I don't pass them. When I'm in a restaurant, I don't hesitate to uh, buy them dinner 
because it's my small way of uh, saying thank you for all the hard work that they do. Uh, I have very high standards for this organization. I push it very hard, and the organization is, is responding. Uh, with that, the people get the job done are the leaders in charge of these districts, which are very tough jobs. Uh, they get called at 2 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m. in the morning. I call them at 9 o'clock at night when they're out at the movies with their families on Saturdays, and they respond. So i like to start by introducing the major of this district, Mark Partee. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> and uh, his captain that makes up the dynamic duel, Byron Conway. And we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mel Russell is all the way in the back. <laughs> uh, uh, Mel has a neighborhood, uh, what do we call that, Mel? Neighborhood and... Community Partnership Division. Yeah, that too. Uh, it's, my, it's my community policing uh, component of the police the organization. I had an opportunity to uh, promote Mel to uh, did, do what he did in the Eastern for the entire city. You know, usually when uh, uh, I'm out pretty much almost every night at some part in the community, uh, at, at some event, and I'm sharing the things that we're doing and answering questions. I'm not going to talk too much to make sure that this is not a dog and pony show, but I'm um, going to answer your questions and make sure that you have an opportunity to ans a answer any questions. You know, one of the things that uh, often uh, police departments talk about uh, crime stats. Uh, if you look at our crime stats right now, they're down in every category with exception of one. And you will see things like 16% uh, reduction, 12%, 23%. 19%, 25%, 11%, all reductions in all categories. The only, only category we're, we're up in for the city as a whole is auto theft. And that's becoming a very big problem for us because in the culture of Baltimore, not only do you mention what high school that you go to on a regular basis, you leave your keys in the cars. And so we're having cars stolen at a high number within our city, which is coming very problematic. What I was told initially is because it was cold weather and people like to start their cars and leave the cars running before they go out but it's not snowing anymore. And people are still starting their cars and leaving them with the keys in them. They'll drive up to 7-Eleven and leave their cars, the keys in the cars. Uh, so that's an issue for us as a whole. Now we had a very busy weekend uh, this weekend, but uh, I expect to have ebbs and flows. We've been doing extremely well for the last three and a half months as an organization. We're going into uh, the, the toughest time for the city of Baltimore, which tends to be uh, May and uh, part of June. But uh, we're going to stick with our plan. We're going to continue to do what we're, we're going to do, and we hope to uh, continue with the success. One of the things that uh, I brought to the table is, uh, based on my, my experience and my practice, I like to have a corporate business plan. When I come to the table, I like, have to, like to have a plan on, number one, how we deal with crime, number two, what we're deal, do, dealing with an organization as a whole. So this, this corporation is a $420 million corporation. And with that, that we have the, tox, the taxpayers' dollars. So we came up with a plan so everybody would know exactly what we're doing and how to hold us accountable and how we're addressing those concerns. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this, but the questions we're, that we're asking here, we're asking our customer base, are we hitting the target in the way that you want us to hit the target as a police department? We give a service. Our service is responding and, and making sure you're safe. Number two is when you call us, do we come in a rapid ma manner? And this is our grade book on what you were telling us. And the reality of what this book says is that we're missing the target. So what we have to do is go back to the drawing board and what my job is to do is recalibrate this organization to put it in alignment with what my customers say that they want. And those are the taxpayers of the city in the way that they think we should be doing it. Now this book is based on three, three different principles. One is crime. And not just, uh, not just violent crime, because that's job number one. And the mayor made that clear Dealing with the violent crime is job number one. But the probability or even a possibility of a woman being hit in the head and drug into an alley and raped, that's important to me. The potentiality for your house getting broken into, that's important to me. The potentiality of having your car broken into, that's important to me. So for us, what we push is not just one category of crime, but crime that impacts different communities in different ways that we address them. So job number one is crime. Job number two is community, and what I'm trying to build within this police department is an organization that listens to the community. We don't come and tell the community what they need to do, we listen to what they're telling us and make, that, make those into our imperatives. And the last C is credibility. 
I have no tolerance for scandals. I have no tolerance for police officers who do not hold that standard of public trust because it goes into everything that we do. Crime, community, credibility. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Batts. So we have with us a, I believe I just saw Delegate Nathaniel Oaks just come in, Madam Mayor. I just wanted a few of the uh, Baltimore delegation, Senator Lisa Gladden in the back. Uh, we have a few folks. We have some seats, by the way, for folks who are standing. Uh, please come on in and have a seat. We have some seats over to my right, your left. I would like to introduce, we've heard from Ms. Patricia Rodout Howard. Uh, the president of the Community Relations Council. There are two other uh, representatives joining us on the front row. They are Ms. B. Scott of Ashburton Area Improvement, excuse me, the Ashburton Area Improvement Association. If you would just raise your hand, Ms. <coughs> Ms. Scott. Welcome. And we have with us, many of you know him uh, as a community advocate, certainly as uh, a friend of the uh, JCC, and that is Mr. Abraham Sauer, who is joining us from, he's president of the Cross Country, Cross Country uh, Improvement Association. Tonight, for the question and answer portion of the uh, forum, we will have a question lifted by one of the uh, uh, community leaders that I just introduced, and then we will open the floor up for two questions. So one question from the front row, and then we're opening the floor up for two, maybe three, uh, depending on what the time is looking like. And then we will come back to the front row for another question from one of the community leaders. Starting us out tonight will be uh, Ms. Patricia Rodout Howard. Uh, if you would just raise your hand. Uh, we have, by the way, Mr. Christian Song on my left and Mr. Larry Nunley, both who will have cordless mics and will come to you we ask that you stand, introduce yourself, present your question, and then have a seat. Reason being, one, there are cameras in the room that we need the cameras to have a view. Two, for our residents and the neighbors in the audience, we want them to have an opportunity to see the response. Thank you. Patricia Rideout Howard, CRC. And the first question is, what are your plans for younger children to stay off the street? So I'll just say it's a, that's a very large question. I can talk about some of the things that we've just done. Uh, so if you talk about staying off the street when, they are, when our young people are at risk of um, be, being harmed or being a harm to others, so that's after curfew, I, I really want to thank the council for being supportive of my uh, youth connection centers that I talked about during my State of the City address. Uh, right now we have a, a curfew center that's open during the summer. And the curfew center uh, connects young people to services that they need uh, during the summer months if they're out after curfew. And uh, the uh, councilman uh, Scott has been there numerous uh, times to the curfew center and it breaks your heart when you're there uh, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, uh, and later, and see six-year-olds, seven-year-olds. I mean, I can barely stay up that late. And to think that these kids are being uh, brought in because they are out just hanging out on the street with no adult supervision. There's no adult to be found. You know, that is troubling to me. And the fact is, the fact of the matter is, while we have the curfew center open during the during the summer, this is a problem that exists all during the year. Uh, so uh, I'm very pleased that the the uh, council uh, members have been supportive of the Youth Connection Centers that will be there all year round. Uh, social Service is there, Department of Juvenile Justice is there, school system is there, we're there. You know, all of the, the um, all of us that, that, that provide service to young people and families are there to try to, to, to bridge that gap for those families and figure out what's going on. What, what didn't happen in that home that allowed this child to be out on the street? So that's one of the things we're doing. We're also uh, trying to enhance uh, what, we're, what we are providing to young people as far as recreational activities. You know, we are in, the, in uh, this district, uh, we are uh, working as part of our capital plan for uh, aquatics. Uh, we are renovating uh, Cahill. Uh, we, are, we have a long range uh, plan for 
um, reinvesting in our uh, recreation centers. So we, we have started uh, with our expanded recreation centers, longer hours, bigger centers, uh, more programming. Um, you, and I know that you're familiar with the process we, we went through to, to get there, and, and we are uh, pleased that we're not just you know cutting ribbons and opening, but we're you know breaking ground and, and doing the same thing. We're we're going to be working on the uh, rec the larger enhanced recreation center in Cherry Hill uh, soon, uh, and we're also we added to what we offer as far as programming for uh, young people is. Uh, uh, they don't want me to call it midnight because it's like a little before midnight. So it's a, it's a night basketball league that a lot of people have uh, requested that we figure out a way to bring night basketball uh, back to, to Baltimore. And we were, uh, that was one of the things that I un unveiled. I think we unveiled it in the, it might have been a little bit after the State of the City, but we're able to, to provide that. It was during the, yeah. So uh, we're, we're going to be doing that as well uh, to give young people an opportunity uh, to have quality uh, activities when they need it. So those are just a little. Those are just a little uh, bit of it. I mean, I could, we could go on and on, but those are the kind of the newest things that we're doing. Commissioner, did you want to add? Yes, ma'am. If if I may. No. Part of uh, what we're doing with the police department also is uh, we're trying to rebuild our image in a different way. You know, and many times people see us as those who are coming in and dragging their aunts and their uncles off the jail and making an impact within their community. And part of what I have with Lieutenant Colonel Mel Russell, and the reason that I have him online, is that we're trying to change our image. And we want to be seen as a part of the, the government that brings hope. Not just despair, but we bring hope. And, and that we help the community to survive. And when we're dealing with our young kids, is part of what we're trying to do is break down barriers. One of the things that uh, I have Mel rolling out this summer is that those neighborhoods where we have some type of violence or trauma that has taken place in that neighborhood, we're taking out uh, from uh, Rec and Parks, we're taking out one of their vans, and their mobile vans have uh, basketballs and, and courts and baseballs and bats and all those different things, this huge van. And we're going out into those neighborhoods where you have that trauma, and officers, and you have NSUs in every district. So I'm gonna pull the NSUs who usually work with the community, I'm gonna put them in to cars to answer calls for service, and those officers that usually work those cars and the post, the post officers who are seen as the ones who are taking, um, impacting, they're gonna get out there and we're gonna shut down the street and we're gonna get those officers out there engaging with those young people on a different level than what they're used to. Now people may say, why is that important? Because in those days that we're not playing basketball, we need to have relationships with those young people and to talk to them, especially when they're out of school. Now I didn't grow up in Baltimore and every time I give a speech, I sincerely apologize for not going to high school here because I apologize for not going to Dunbar. I apologize for not going to Poly. I apologize <laughs> for not going to Douglas and on and on and on. Because if you're from Baltimore, it has to be the high school that you went to. Uh, but I grew up in a very poor neighborhood. And I share that. My mother says, could you stop telling people that? I'm very proud of the fact that I, where I came from and that uh, my family helped me pull, up, pull, pull myself up by my bootstraps and get an education and go on to be in charge of the eighth largest police department in the United States out of 18,000 police organization. That means a lot to me because I easily could have went right. I had a lot of friends who did go the opposite direction. I have a lot of relatives who went the wrong direction. And it wasn't for the fact that I had mentors or people who touched me that made a difference. People in uniforms that wore police uniforms made a difference in my life. And you can see the dramatic impact in that. So we can point fingers at government and ask government, what are you doing? How are you going to make an impact? But I'm going to push back. I may ruffle some feathers and I may piss some people off, but that's okay. I've been doing that for 33 years of my life or more, so I'm, I'm going to push back. Community also has a responsibility with these kids out here. And the government cannot do everything and be everything for everyone. The community has to step up. And even parts of the community that look different, parts of the community that have different cultures, parts of the community that are not used to uh, interacting with each other, they have a role to mentor young kids that are out here. And one lady that I, I made mention last time, she actually heard about it, was not even in this, this part of town, but I was sharing how impressed I was of her because she tends to be a critic of government. And you know, when you see her, she's kind of throwing her finger up and going like this and pointing her finger towards government. But on the opposite side, there's another side to this lady. And I got a chance to see, she, she uh, went out and found money to take over our parks and rec location. And she asked me to come out on her own 
And she had this, this uh, collaboration with young people that she brings in. She also uh, uh, gets food for hungry people in the community. Yeah, the one day that I went out, she had horses in the back. How'd you get horses out here? And she says, where there's a willow way. But uh, um, Kim Trueheart, who's sitting over there in the front row, is uh, the lady that I'm talking about. And, she, uh, and I told her, I just had to give her a hug, and I had to tell her, she puts her money where her mouth is. It's not just government having to solve the problems. That's someone of the community taking this on and grabbing it by the throat and saying, I'm going to make a difference. Now, you know, some of you may not be able to do all of that, and you may not make that happen. Some of you may not even uh, feel comfortable talking to teenagers who may be hanging out here on these street corners uh, from time to time. But how many people are afraid to mentor a five-year-old? How many people are afraid to touch a seven-year-old? How many people are afraid to impact an eight-year-old? Because the criticality to this, and I say this and I get really passionate about it because I truly believe in it. I am a product of mentoring. I am a product of somebody giving a darn to touch my life to make a difference. And if we could take one hour out of looking at the basketball playoffs or going looking at football and just mentor a child for one stinking hour a week to make an impact on a life, you can more than help the crime rate. You can help turn the city of Baltimore around. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Commissioner. So we will come over to my left, but our first hand up was on the right here, and that is actually Miss Trueheart. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for introducing me. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I, it's not on. It's on. It's on. Um, I want to first thank you, Commissioner, for coming to Baltimore, and I think you are the right man for the job. I have faith in you. I'm going to push you. Okay. I want to thank all of your officers for serving and wearing the uniform proudly. There are some who need to get kicked to the curb. And I, I'm sure you are working on that, but if you need some help, let us know. Um, I hope that you will continue to perform um, the duties of the office without any political encumbrances. And if political figures jump in the way of progress, then let us know, because we will remove them, okay? Um, one of the things that I asked you, Mayor, four years ago, was to reform every service in this city that serves our children, every service. For some reason, you haven't responded to that, but that's okay. But, but we know that our children have been disinvested in this city for far too long. You closed 17 rec centers. I hear rumor, the good rumor, and I want to give you credit if it's true, that you are attempting to reopen some of those rec centers, the ones that are habitable, and I appreciate the fact that some weren't. But if you are, then please, please do it. Do it because our children deserve it. Amen. Do it because our children need it. And if you need somebody to partner with, come see me. If you need somebody to help you run those rec centers, come see me. I don't know how to say this, but our children deserve so much more. You, you cannot sit there and not understand that they have been disinvested in. That's right. They have been marginalized. Uh, yes. Do more. You have to do more. If you can't, leave the job. Yes. Whoa. We will help you leave the job. We'll find you a new job. But you cannot sit in that job and keep ignoring our children. The rec centers are the place where they can be loved. The rec center is the place where we will love them. If you need help opening those rec centers, I got help for you. Hey, Kim, can I respond to your first question? Because I told you you were going to throw that finger. Did she throw that finger up there? And she always throws that finger. I love her to death, but she, uh, she holds us accountable. I got, I got to answer this, and I got to say this with all sincerity. Is uh, This is the third police department that I've been at. Um, and I chose to come here because I wanted to, and I chose to come before the leadership of the city, and that's the critical piece for me. I'm at the stage of life where I get to work where I want to work. Um, you know, I, I left uh, a, a place and I was very comfortable, but it was the leadership of this city and really having strong conversations 
that made a concrete difference for me. You know, I, I, left, I left my previous job because I had political interference. Uh, I couldn't get my job done. I had someone telling me what to do. I couldn't make the decisions. Um, uh, it's not like I hadn't done, done the job before and knew what I was doing. But I said, enough is enough, and I don't want to tolerate this anymore. I got to tell you here is that uh, I have a mayor who's extremely supportive of what I get done. I have a mayor who, um, and it's, it comes from behind closed doors. It's one thing where you have conversations like this in the public, but I also look at the conversations I have behind the scenes and if their heart's in the right place. And I, don't play, I call balls and strikes. And if I don't like something, I say I don't like it. I don't worry about it and I get myself in trouble. I do that. But I'm telling you, this lady next to me, and I'm not saying it to, to get a, a stroke from her or a pat on the back, she loves this city. It's in her heart, it's in her blood, and she has a passion for it. So I, this is a tough job for anybody. I can tell you this, it's a tough job being a commissioner. It's 10 times tough job being a mayor of a city like Baltimore, but she's out there working her butt off trying to make a difference. Here. And I still love you, Kim. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, sir. I think the question was. The question. We she did not answer my question. The mayor didn't answer the question. Right. The question was not answered. I will say I would. We don't have enough time in the evening for me to satisfy uh, you. Um, I, I, my record speaks for itself. No other mayor spoke. I didn't interrupt Miss Truhart when she was speaking. Did I? Did I? Then I think I deserve the same respect. I think, I think many administration have spoken about their investment in young people, and I've been willing to take, make the tough decisions to actually put my money and my effort where my mouth is. No other mayor got over a billion dollars in school construction to, to, to reshape the future of education. That is not done, not in Baltimore. And I'm sorry hasn't been done in Baltimore before or anywhere else in the country. And yes, um, as I've spoken before, we close recreation centers because you can't, everyone knows, common sense, you can't spend the same dollar twice. And we cannot keep uh, dilapidated, unsafe, and underutilized centers open and, in, and use that money to keep them open and plan for better. And when the community says they want better, I'm not going to placate you. I'm not going to tell you what you need, you what you want to hear. I'm not going to do what was done before, which is for the sake of being able to say that they were open, we had places that you wouldn't send your enemy into. But now, because I have a vision and I'm putting my money behind that vision, we are not just closing, we are building. We've been able to open rec centers that have been closed for years. We are building new rec centers and we are doing that all over the city. We are building, uh, new aquatic center, you know, the, the investments are being made because of the tough decisions that I've made. So I believe my record speaks for itself. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Before I come to the gentleman next to Senator Gladden, let me again just say for the sake of respecting the process, we're not going to interrupt those who are asking the question, and we certainly aren't going to interrupt those who answer the question. Can I have a follow-up? Can I hear by a round of applause those of you who agree with that? <laughs> Ms. Truhart, I'm gonna let the gentleman next to Senator Gladden ask his question. And then we will hear a response. Yes, sir. It's my pleasure and privilege to introduce a cons one of my favorite constituents, co-constituents in the city, Senator Lisa Gladden. <laughs> okay, I have a question to the mayor or to the commissioner of the police. What's your strategy for making the police department local? And because I would say if I had to, first off, I live around the neighborhood, I live here. And I remember when I was a child, Police officers live next door to me, or they lived up the street from me. But now, police officers live in Pennsylvania. They live all outside of Baltimore City. And the thing is, if we are engaged and committed to making the city safer, make the police officers live here. 
make them live here. And so while it's a, it's a purely constituent question that I have to both of you, what's your strategy for making sure the officers are local? Because Commissioner, I went to Weston High School. Yay Weston. Yay Weston. And quite frankly, Delegate Oaks, he, went to, he graduated from Emerson. So we're all local here. And I just think when you have strangers policing your community, it's like foreign occupation. And I just don't think it's right for Baltimore City, and I don't think it's right for our community. I agree. You know, one of the things that uh, my goal is to do is uh, to get as many police officers. If, there's two ways that you can do it. Is get as many police officers from Baltimore City uh, to become police officers here. That is a goal of mine. That is, that is my passion. Uh, right now, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you so you understand what the issue is. Because you have a role, too. You're going to see that that kind of pops up. Is that um, we have a lot of uh, uh, applicants are coming from New York, New Jersey, uh, Delaware, Pennsylvania. And so we have a lot, of a lot of applicants coming from outside of the state of Maryland. Not just the city of Baltimore, but outside of the state of Maryland as a whole. Part of what I need help and assistance from you is to encourage these young people from the city of Baltimore to be to want to become a Baltimore police officer. Now, there's a lot there's a lot of pieces that go into that, and uh, we're picking up as many right in this class that we had now that started about three weeks ago. We had a large number of Baltimoreans in that class, and I was very proud of the diversity of this class. Uh, it was racially diverse, it was gender diverse, and a lot of them were from Baltimore. But at the same time. The other 50% was probably from out of state again. A lot of New Yorkers, a lot of people from north of here, and I need your help to, to, to try to change that because we're looking for uh, citizens and residents from Baltimore. So the more that you encourage our young people here to get involved, part of what we're doing is expanding our Explorer, Explorer program to tell the young kids early on, this is what you need to do if you want to become a police officer. You, got, you need to stay away from drugs. You need to stay away from alcohol. You need to stay away from making those mistakes that will follow you, that will not allow you to become a police officer. So we're starting to have those conversations uh, citywide with the young people that are out there. Uh, I'm starting an advisory group so I can listen to the kids. And I think the biggest piece for us is that we have to be seen as heroes in these communities. And when you're seen as a hero in the community, the kids will want to replicate or, or be just like you. And so part of what we're doing on a bigger scale is changing our image within the community as a whole so we become part of that community. Uh, with the officers that are already here, we're trying to get them out of the cars and in, in, into walking beats on a regular basis so they get to touch. Uh, what I hear from residents all the time is when I was a kid, this officer used to walk the beat and I used to see him all the time. I hear that. I'm paying attention to that. And, every, and in every way that we're doing is getting those officers out of the street so we make the contact with that community, so those young kids see us uh, and the things that we're doing. I'll tell you a little quick story, if I may, Madam Mayor, if I don't take too much, too much time. And then also, we're looking at to do, to doing a housing uh, allowance, working with the kids to get the, to get the young officers to buy in the city of Baltimore, too, so we're doing it on that end. But I'm going to tell you a, a story that sticks out to me consistently. Um, I was doing a thing in the Western, just down the street, and a news camera was interviewing me. And as they were interviewing me, there was little girls in the back that were playing, just doing, doing things that babies were doing out there. So at the conclusion, I just, to the conclusion, I just wanted to say hi to them. So myself and a couple of my guys go over and uh, say hi to the little ones. They're probably about three years old, four years old. And so the little, first thing the little girl says, little girl number one says, are you going to shoot me? And the other little girl says, and I'm not making this up, the other little girl says, are you taking me to jail? So these are babies who are three and four years old, and their personification of a police officer is someone who's bringing some pain to the community. And what I said to them is, sweetie, all I want to do is give you a hug. I said, what, you, what I want you to walk away with is knowing that we're here to help, and we're not here to make a, a negative impact. So as we go forward to bring more police officers here, what we have to do, and the community has a role in that too, is how we show that we have very good police officers here. Now, the, the officers who don't do well, then I address that, and I'll hold them accountable. But the, for the police officers who care, the police officers who give money out of their pocket, the police officers who want to make a difference in a very positive way, then they're trying, they're trying to go in that direction. So that will help. When our image turns around, when we become a part of the community, 
those numbers will come from the city of Baltimore for people to get involved. But I also need you to just tell people, and I just got this and I'll shut up, I'm just passionate about this. I had a, I had a grizzled veteran just uh, uh, on Thursday, a grizzled veteran, been here about 25 years, and he says, Commissioner, for the first time in 15 years, I feel inspired. You know why that's critical? Because the majority of people come to an organization where the employees say, this is a good place to work. And when you have a grizzled veteran who stands up and says, we're going in the right direction, we're connecting with the community, we're getting the right tools to do the job here in the police department, that's when our numbers from Baltimore will go up. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. I would say to add to that a, a few things, uh, Senator Gladden, I think in a perfect world, every person that worked for the city uh, would live in the city. I mean, how much more, how much would our tax base be increased if, if that were uh, the case? But I do know with respect to um, public safety uh, employees, public safety uh, workers, um, you know, it, it is, we cannot require residency. I think Pittsburgh just lost a, a lawsuit over uh, residency uh, requirements. So what do we do in response to that? Uh, we create incentives for police officers to want to uh, live in Baltimore. We create pathways for first responders to want to live in Baltimore. Uh, when I introduced Chief Ford, our fire chief, I talked about the pathways that he is establishing using our high schools as the fire department's farm team. Uh, he's committed to uh, having more Baltimore residents employed in the fire department. Uh, what do we do in the police department? Um, one of the first uh, incentive programs I put in place with my vacancy value initiative, which is my blight elimination plan, was the incentives for fire and police to uh, move uh, into the city. Now I expanded it to all city employees, but it's there. It is there and it creates an incentive. Also, the, um, I think with the, the uh, new contracts, you know, the, the contract that we have for buyer has been um, you know, very positive, been uh, received well, and the tentative agreement that we have, uh, we negotiated with the FOP, I think is gonna be fantastic uh, in uh, helping us to retain uh, officers uh, in the city as well as to, to make the police force more attractive um, a, a, a more attractive opportunity for uh, Baltimore residents. We were able to increase the salary, uh, you know, change the hours to give more flexibility, as well as put things like the tuition reimbursement back in place. So that makes it a, a, an attractive uh, opportunity, I, I hope, for more Baltimoreans. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As promised earlier, we took two questions from the floor. Now we'll take one from the front row from Ms. B. Scott, and then we'll come back to the floor. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Mr. Commissioner. Um, we know that litter-filled, dirty environments invite criminal behavior. How can Baltimore schools better educate children and youth to exercise leadership in creating a cleaner Baltimore, and why aren't creative, emotional, um, motivational public service announcements, the old PSAs. Why aren't they being aired to lift the consciousness of parents and all citizens? Messaging, messaging about clean is important and messaging works. So first, thank you for your, uh, your service to um, you know, the neighborhood of my, you know, my home, my, uh, my home neighborhood, my mom's current neighborhood. Uh, you know, it's not that it's not being done, it's just it's, it is a different time. You know, I remember trash fall, I remember you know, all of the things coming up, but you have to understand at that point we had three TV stations, right? So if it was, if it was on TV, everybody saw it. Uh, but we have a, a whole different landscape out there now. So yes, we have PSAs. We also have it on, um, we have the, our Clean Up Baltimore uh, campaign uh, that, we, that we have is on. We have PSAs, we have the um, you kind of the, the things on the, the internet, on the website for, for DPW. I know the school system has efforts uh, to, about being good stewards for, um, for being good stewards of our planet because my daughter comes home um, from school talking about, you know, turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth and do this and do that. All of the different things that I know that she is learning um, uh, from school about being good, good stewards. So we know that those things are out there. It's just um, a little bit more difficult to penetrate 
the culture in the same way. Um, but we are, we are out there and we're, we're open to suggestions. If you think that uh, you have a way that we can, we can uh, penetrate the, the culture in a, in a bigger way, please um, let us know. There are, we're not alone. Uh, we are talking about this um, as well as uh, some community-based organizations. Uh, there's a zero, uh, uh, zero Litter Baltimore campaign that is out there. Councilman Mosby has a, a trash uh, campaign. And it's, there's a lot that's, that's out there. I just think it, it, it's, gonna t it's gonna continue to, to take uh, more because uh, while the, I think um, you know, some of our kids are interested in uh, keeping the city clean, they're unfortunately um, going home to parents who you know, throw the McDonald's wrappers and everything else, the chicken boxes and everything else out in the street when they, when they leave. And, and we also have to be you know, aware in this district in particular about the, you know, the illegal dumping. And it's, it is a very pervasive problem. And I all, you know, uh, Councilman Spector, we've had the problem when it was the multi-member district. And I know Councilman Middleton can attest, you know, it's, the frustration goes on and on and on. And, it's, and people are, uh, act as if you know, it's, it's Martians coming down throwing trash. It's us. It's our neighbors, and we have to do better, um, you know, making sure that uh, we have eyes on the street. We do have some illegal dumping cameras that are being being helpful. But all of that to say, um, we are out there. I think, uh, you know, part of what this is about getting feedback on how we can work better together. If you think that there's a way that that we can get that message out there, and um, you know, if the if the campaign that we have is not uh, does not inspire. Uh, you, you sufficiently were open to, to others. Thank you. Uh, before we go to our next question, I would like to say that those of you who have surveys in your hand, uh, suggestion like the one that was just made, uh, that's a good opportunity for you to write down a suggestion you may have. And there's a box downstairs at the same table that you signed up or received that uh, survey. If you could just return a survey in that box. Uh, next question, yes sir, introduce yourself uh, and pose your question. Uh, my name is uh, Nathan Wilner. Uh, I first want to just start by, by thanking the mayor for the job she's doing. It's, it's a difficult, difficult job and we are really, really lucky to have you. Uh, the one thing that our community really notices is that you love this city as much as we do. So thank you so much for everything you do for our community. <laughs> I especially want to thank you for bringing Commissioner Bass to the city. Uh, recently, uh, showroom members and rabbis and other members of the community met with the commissioner, and your responsiveness has been unbelievable. Uh, just the compassion you have for crime victims and the situations that we brought to your attention and the response has just been overwhelming. So we just really want to thank you. Uh, we want to thank the major and the captain for the work they do in the Northwest. It doesn't go unnoticed. Uh, similar to what you said, uh, this is for the first time in, in a while, we're really feeling the progress. Perfect, we don't have perfect yet, and we may never have perfect, but progress. And progress is something that really brings hope. So I just wanna thank both of you for all the work you do for us. It's really, uh, really means a lot to our community. My question is, what can we do more? What can we do to really help the department and bring morale up within the department and within the community? And um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. I, I sincerely appreciate that on behalf of the, the men and women who do the job on a daily basis. You know, in this strategic plan, we asked uh, a number of questions uh, of the community, uh, but we also asked a number of questions of uh, the employees. And we basically asked them what, what they thought about their, their organization, because they, they're in a critical piece. One of the, the profound or, or epiphanies that came out of this is I believe it's 19% of the employees in the organization believe that they're appreciated by the community. Only 19, maybe you didn't hear me, only 19% of the employees in the organization believe that they're appreciated by the community. And so if you were to ask me what can we do, I think when we have the opportunities to tell these men and women uh, that they're doing a good job, to tell them what they do matters, to tell them what they go out there and risk their lives and their families' lives uh, over on a daily basis is something that's important to you in the job that they serve. So anytime that uh, you have a, a chance to have a block party and invite our guys over, 
anytime you had a chance to to say any, any, uh, the slightest nice thing, if it's through a letter and uh, for a letter of uh, accommodations, because when they get letters uh, for the job that they're done, it goes toward their promotions. And so that's an incentive for them. We don't get bonuses. We don't get extra pay from other people. The biggest thing that we get are those letters, and it means a lot to us. I can tell you growing up in policing that when I got a letter from a resident that said, you did a good job, we appreciated that, I tried to replicate that. What I'm really trying to push through the organization is I want them, when you come in contact with the officers here, that you walk away going, wow, they didn't have to do that. They went the extra mile, they helped us out. So anytime that you can uh, give that feedback, whether it's in writing to the newspaper, whether it's writing to the, the police department, whether it's a simple accolade to bring them in and to give them a hot dog or give them something healthy, uh, uh, bring them in. Because I don't want brown police officers. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're, we're going on a health kick here right now. Uh, but uh, anything along those lines, I think that 19%, they need to hear. Much like you guys uh, don't often always hear uh, all the positive things that employees are doing out there, employees always don't hear that the community actually cares about. Thank you, Commissioner. Lady in the black, yes. Hi, um, I just want to say first that I um, really appreciate what the Commissioner said about police efficacy and accountability. I'm sorry, this is really difficult. Um, eight months ago, I was raped. And the Baltimore City Police failed to apprehend and take care of the rapist. A month ago, I came to an NWCP meeting and I said the same thing that I'm saying to you now. Officers Dickstein and Conway talked to me after the meeting and I received no follow-up yet again from the Baltimore City Police. I am tired of reliving this trauma over and over and hearing nothing back from the police. I am sorry that you have been a victim of any trauma within this city. It's unacceptable uh, that we haven't responded as an organization. But what I do guarantee you is right now, Jeremy, if you would make sure that you make contact. What I do not want to hear in the next meeting is that we did not follow up and that we did not make contact. Uh, so I personally will follow up in the morning to make sure that uh, we reach out and that we make contact with you. So I give you my word that that will happen. Sir, before we go to the next uh, question, and the next person jumping on the front here. If there are any other people who are here, there are members of the commissioner's staff, members of his command, other officers uh, that are outside of this room. If you would like, and sir, certainly by your direction, I uh, would like to meet with an officer off of the camera, out of sight of other neighbors, um, certainly you can, there are officers posted at both of the exit signs. Um, uh, you can certainly do so. I, I would like to uh, ask that we just put our hands together and give her a round of applause for her carriage. <laughs> yes, sir, this young man has been patient. I've seen him at several public safety forums. He's always sitting next to a gentleman we refer to as Shorty. Where's the microphone? Yes. And we're just asking that. Here's your opportunity to pose your question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh -huh. uh, hi, everyone. My name is Leo Zimmerman. Um, as a resident of Baltimore and as a human being, I am deeply concerned about acts of wrongful imprisonment and acts of senseless brutality committed by this police department against people in Baltimore. I am a member of a group called the Public Safety Collective that is focused on policing the police and talking about stories of people who have been affected by police brutality and police violence. I would like to gently remind, or maybe not gently, so gently remind the mayor and the police commissioner of the letter uh, our group gave them on April 10th asking for more information about people who have been victimized by the police. We want to know a list of people who have been killed as a result of police actions. Even if all this leads to is further discussion, uh, the public deserves to know more names, like 
Maurice Donald Johnson and George Booker Wells III and Anthony Anderson and Tyrone West, people who have been killed as a result of unnecessary, brutal, senseless police violence. And my question to each of you, because I've heard you speak on this issue before, my question to each of you is what are you personally doing to address serial killers like Jorge Ruiz and Nicholas David Chapman who remain in action in the Baltimore Police Department, serial killers in the police department. Every time I hear you speak about this, you refer to other parts of the process. There was no prosecution, there was no, I don't care about that. I want to know what you are doing personally to address these, these people who are committing serial acts of violence and, and killing against people in Baltimore. Thank you, Mr. Zane. No, I speak on a pretty regular basis at community meetings, and um, um, I've answered these questions a multitude of times, and, and I think they come up because we're on TV. But I, I want to share with you what my role is. No. I want to share with you what, what my role is. The mayor brought me in here to be a reformer, and the direction that she's given me is to reform this police organization. Now, there's some things that are wrong uh, within our organization. I didn't break them. But what my job is to do is to repair them, to fix them, to make them better as an organization. And we're moving in that direction. And one of the things that I, I am doing, and I'm not gonna address every individual, nor am I gonna get into the micro, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk from the macro, is that um, what I have said clear to the organizations from day one is that I've been very privileged to hire many police officers, uh, probably literally in the hundreds or not thousands uh, throughout my career. I've had the opportunity to put uh, medals of valor around multiple necks of officers who've risked their lives and have done a good job. But I've also not hesitated to put handcuffs on police officers who have stepped out of line and have broken that public trust. Now personally, I've been doing that for a long time and I don't back away from it. I don't step away from it. And you know, I, I think I got one of my uh, biggest compliments from the Tyrone West family not too long ago. And uh, these gentlemen are, are part of uh, that association. Now they stood up in a community meeting and said, the person that, I, that we trust from family members is Tony Batts. Because uh, I call those balls and I call those strikes. When uh, I landed, my first day was, I landed on a Sunday. Anthony Anderson had had an interaction with the police officers and uh, he lost his life in that interaction. And uh, that was, uh, I landed on Sunday, that took place on Friday. On Monday morning, when I, the first day I came to work, I was meeting with the Anderson family. I went to their home knowing, knowing that their family had been impacted and they had dealt with trauma, but I wanted them to know that human life means something to me. I don't care what life that is, human life means something to me. What I've told this organization clearly is that I expect, I demand, I have a standard that we will have a reverence for human life, and I don't care who it is, I expect when we have confrontations, there are gonna be confrontations, that takes place in our job. But we do it professionally, and everyone goes home, and that is my goal to make that happen. Now at the same time with the Anthony Anderson case, I was open, I was transparent. I brought people in from the outside, I didn't want people saying that we are circling the wagons and we're holding them back the truth and we're not gonna share. I brought in people from the outside to look at every part of that investigation. And all that I asked them when we came in is, tell the truth. If we did something wrong, tell the truth. If the officers did what they were supposed to, to, to do, tell the truth, and that's what they did. They stood in front of cameras, came before this community, and said they didn't see things that were out of line. It was an unfortunate incident but it wasn't seen out of line. That wasn't something that I told them to say. That wasn't something that I directed them to say. That is from their investigation. With the Tyrone West case, I've done the same thing. I brought in experts, and they're in the middle of the panel of the experts, and I gave them the same direction. When you guys go through this, all I'm asking you to do is tell the truth. And when we conclude this, you go up to that podium, good, bad, or indifferent, we tell the truth. Now, if there's something that we did wrong, I will hold people accountable. I've been holding people accountable. 
I've fired people and terminated them out of this organization. I've pushed people out of the organization that do not hold the standard. But when they stand up there and if the officers did the right thing, I'm also going to stand in support of the officers and said they did what they needed to do. Now that's unfortunate that we have a loss of life, but I will continue to push and I will demand that this organization shows that it has a reverence for human life and for humanity and I will not back off of that. I, I want to add to that um, you know, part of the conversation that the commissioner knows that I had with him when I brought him on, which was that when I spoke to uh, community leaders, and some of them were from the Northwest community, uh, as I was preparing to interview for the police commissioner, I made it abundantly clear that we will not be a substantially safer city if we don't do it in partnership with the community. Um, I, did, I, I heard from everyone in the city, and it didn't matter what color, what religion, how much money they were making, what the zip code was, everyone said the same thing, that we want to work in partnership. I heard very clearly from some members of the community that, uh, that they were exhausted of feeling like they were the enemy and feeling like they were under siege in their own communities. And I know very clearly, I think everybody knows, that I cannot ask you, I cannot have a handout in partnership uh, with community members who feel like they're under siege. It just doesn't work like that. Um, and that was one of the things uh, that I made very clear uh, with the commissioner as uh, we were interviewing and something that I talk about when I uh, speak at uh, graduation for new officers. You know, I, I try to impart to them uh, the, same, the, the same lessons that I was taught growing up, that you treat people the way uh, that you want to be treated. That um, I remember my mom talking to an em employee that she thought was being disrespectful to someone. And she told him very clearly, she said, when you go home tonight, you're gonna be able to put food on the table for your family. When you go home, it's at a home that you paid for the rent or the mortgage with the paycheck that that person provided for you. You know, you have to treat people with respect. That's how I was taught. That's why I try my hardest every single day to treat everyone uh, with respect, to not ascribe motives uh, or uh, ill uh, to, to malice just because I disagree with someone. You have to find ways that we can have the, the respect and, and raise a level of civility because we're all in this together. And um, so I do expect for the commissioner to hold officer, officers accountable for uh, their misbehavior, but I also expect the commissioner and, and all of us to stand uh, behind the officers who every single day they go to, to work. There are not too many jobs uh, that when you show up to work on any given day, you're putting your life on the line. That's right. And I, I expect us all to, to, to thank you. To, but the, it's for them. It, you know, it is, it, it is um, you know, it, it's a, a far too often a thankless job. It, it is a, a job at high risk, but it's a job that each and every one of us depend on having people who are willing to do that so we can all be safe. Uh, so, that, so it's a two-way street as far as, as respect, and, and, I ex, and I expect and implore uh, the police officers to really raise the level of uh, relationship with, uh, with the community. That's part of the ceasefire model. One of the, uh, another thing I talked about in my state of the city address was the uh, ceasefire initiative that I was bringing into to Baltimore City. It's a very community-based focus, again, focus on the most violent offenders, uh, and it deals with groups, uh, group violence. And, um, you know, using that uh, ceasefire uh, initiative that has shown promise in so many cities, I know that uh, with the community's uh, support, the progress that we've seen in reducing violence will continue and we can, I, I, I believe, shake loose uh, the, the violent history that we have in, this, in the city and, and make a way for uh, a safer Baltimore. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> there are a number of hands that are up and be, for the sake of time, I will get to as many as I can. I'm gonna start back at the front row with Mr. Abraham. Uh, Sauer from the Cross Country Improvement Association. Thank you. First of all, Madam Mayor, Commissioner Batts, 
Chief Ford, welcome to Northwest Baltimore. This is the best neighborhood in Baltimore City and the entire state of Maryland. It is. You have to go? <laughs> this is the best neighborhood because we have the best representation in this area. And it starts with our council people and it goes straight on up. But there's one person here in Northwest Baltimore. Madam Mayor, you have the best liaison. And Rona Ivy, is she here? <laughs> we, we have a little bit of an inferiority complex though here in Northwest Baltimore. And that is because thanks to Major and the Captain and others here, we don't necessarily have the same issues, problems, or I guess you'd say the crime that you have in other parts of the city. And because of that, our concern is that we're not quote unquote overlooked um, and we have special needs. And you talk about numbers and it's been said, and by the way, I wanna thank you. This is the most passionate meeting I've ever been to and you couldn't pay me enough to sit up there, seriously. <laughs> um, but numbers are important and the one number that's most important is number one. And number one is that person that had whatever crime it was, it could be that piece of paper that was thrown on their yard, to them, that's everything. They don't think about the murders at that time that are going on. And it's those small little crimes that make a big, big difference. We saw New York had a model like that also. And we'd like to see or know a plan for this neighborhood specifically, um, not just the gefilte fish, but uh, <laughs> Commissioner evidently is fond of gefilte fish. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was in the same house actually. Um, but again, we'd like to see something as it relates to just Northwest Baltimore, something that we ensure we're not being overlooked, um, whether it be a quicker response or tracking of crime or something of that sort. If you could address that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. So before the commissioner starts, one of the things that I was pleased that we were able to do with the tentative agreement I spoke about with the new contract is uh, it allows the commissioner the flexibility that he needs to be able to have more officers when we need them so they can do proactive policing. Uh, one, you know, I, I heard it consistently that uh, every, it doesn't matter where I go, people say that they want to see more police officers on the street. Uh, what that, what I interpret that is, they, they want to see more patrol officers not just rushing to the next call, but that are able to build the relationships that we want to have, that we've been talking about. So that the, the new contract will give uh, the commissioner the, the flexibility to give officers uh, to reduce the percentage of time they spend just responding to 911 and give them an opportunity to get out of their cars, which we expect them to do, and to build the build the relationships and to and and to do exactly what you're just talking about, Commissioner. You know, one of the things in this strategic planning, and you'll hear me go back to this all the time because this is my Bible. This is uh, what you hold me accountable for. This is where I'm going. Every time we test an organization, you want to become a police officer, we test off of this. Sergeant, lieutenant, captain, this is what we test off. This is the Bible. And the reason I bring that up is the number two issue, the number one issue that the citizens said that they want us to focus on is violent crime. And it goes with number three, which is gang violence. So violent crime and gang violence. Number two, 911 response. That's the second thing from all residents within this community. And as I, as I have come to the Northwest and I've been at recent meetings with the rabbis and, and other community meetings, is that that's something that we're gonna have to improve on and that we're gonna have to work. The 911, when you pick up that phone and say, I want a police officer, you deserve to get a police officer there. So from the city, uh, uh, city uh, response uh, position, we're gonna start working on that and put things in place uh, we're going to look at districts to make sure that we have enough officers there that we deploy them in the right way. And the mayor is absolutely right. I've never been in a job, and I've shared with you that I've been in a couple of police departments. I've never been in a job where, as, as the commissioner or chief of police, that I didn't have the ability to move people around. And uh, here in Baltimore, the, the deployment was based in a, a FOP contract. So the contract told me when I could put police officers, where I, where I, at what time I could put them. And uh, uh, the mayor and, and uh, city government has been very strong about getting that ability back to us, which gets more officers on the street. When we get more officers on the street at the time that crimes are necessary, we're able to be more proactive. And then I turn that over to the majors who are the chiefs of police of their districts to kind of push forward with that. So I am not, I'm not deferring your question, but what I expect from my, my, because what I'm doing is I'm building future commissioners. And uh, the commissioner that we have right now in charge of Northwest District is Mark Parti, so I'm gonna bring him up to have him answer that question. So 
Good evening, everyone. Um, as the commissioner said, I am Major Mark Partee of the Northwest District. Um, so to speak on, you know, on your point in terms of, uh, in terms of response time, uh, what we put in place in terms of response times is a constant overview of what we're doing, how long it's taking our officers to get there, what they're doing when they get there, and the way that we're doing that is we're making these supervisors responsible and accountable for what their officers are doing. Uh, no longer do uh, the, the sergeants sit in the, in the, day, in the station and, and just bark out orders. They're out there. The captain and myself are out there. So the, the level of accountability that we're putting in place in the Northwest District is second to none. Um, I like to say that we run harder, we push further, and we do a better job than anybody in the city. And I say that because it's my district and I'm kind of partial, but that's what we do in the Northwest District. So, so in essence, um, what I'm trying to do is to get the officers to feel the same passion that the captain and I feel, to be more invested in the community. And when they hear that call, not to say, well, I'll get there in a second. No, you get there when the call is dispatched. And, and this guy right here is, is on these guys, making them work harder than I've ever seen anybody make them work. So the team that we're putting, putting out there in the streets is going to be the, the most uh, streamlined and efficient team that I can put together. You know, the other thing that I was talking about earlier is making sure that uh, we just don't look at uh, two categories of crime. We look at all crimes because different neighborhoods are impacted by different things. One of the things that's popping up in my mind as the mayor and I go around in the city uh, that keeps popping up is uh, illegal dumping. That's becoming, that doesn't seem like that's a major issue, but when you hear every audience that we go to, that's a major issue within our community. So the question becomes, how do we play in that? So part of what we have to start doing, and I'm going to start asking questions, is how do we come up with initiatives that we start looking for people who are doing illegal dumping? I believe uh, the delegates have pushed through a, a law just recently uh, that uh, causes points on your driver's, uh, on your driver's uh, uh, license if you're caught illegal dumping. So applaud them for the good job that they did on that. Uh, well done. Um, and, because, and, and the reason that I bring that is that we, we are trying to build an organization that, that customizes policing based on the community. And this community is totally different than any other community, and so we have to respond to the issues here in a very unique way, in a customized way, to, to pleasure this part of the city. And we will continue to push that direction. Okay. So for the sake of time, I'm probably going to, uh, some of you, many of you were friends when I came in. <laughs> I think I'm gonna make a few enemies, but um, I will try because it is now 8, well, 8.38. 40. There's a young lady that Larry is standing with that I'm going to definitely get to you. And there's a gentleman here where Christian is, so I'm going to definitely get to him. So, ma madam, ma'am, yes, where Larry is, and I'm going to ask you to ask your question, and then I'm going to have the gentleman here with Christian ask his question, and we will have both questions answered. And then I'll come to the lady in the purple and make to as many as I can in the next 15 seconds. I'm Thank kidding. You. Okay. Thank you. You have a lead, right? So it's nice to see both of you and thank you for your hard work first. My question is, I live in East Arlington. Okay, excuse me one second. I'm sorry. Okay, let me uh, just remind everyone again. I know we're probably getting restless. Some folks are unaccustomed to sitting still and being quiet. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I but I want to make sure, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure that you are heard and that we can streamline to the next questions. So I'm going to ask that everyone please remain quiet and respectful. Thank you. This question is really for Your name again? Just Tanya to... Patterson. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. My question is pretty much for the commissioner, I guess. Um, in reference to, I live in the East Arlington area, and lately we've been having a lot of problems with the dirt bikes lots. I have called myself and officers have not responded when the dirt bikes are there. They are taking over the, um, I think it's the Cold Spring station. They're taking over. They ride all over our grass. They ride up and down my alley. They, and this is Council Middleton's area as well because I have called the office. Um, it's awful, and it's been like the last two months, 
every Sunday after 8 p.m. And only maybe one office, and I know you can't chase, I don't know what else you can do. Maybe you can set up barriers to keep you them You said 8 p.m. or 8 a.m.? 8 p.m. It okay. comes every Sunday evening lately for like the last two months, and they are awful. And I mean, they are riding all around our car. It's, you, and you can't do anything. The last Sunday that they came, which was yesterday, oh, cool. today Monday, yes. <laughs> They were like 75, 80, and then they have this entourage of cars and trucks that follow them. They stop up Wabash, they stop up Dorothy. You can't get through and you can't say anything. So I'm just wondering, please, they stop going on Rice Town, what are they gonna do? How can we be helped? You know, when I uh, first came and, and uh, the mayor introduced me and, and we walked around the, the community and the neighborhood, the neighbors came out and that's one of the things that they talked about uh, exclusively, exclusively was uh, the motorcycles and, and the dirt bike riders. Last year we tried something new and different and what we try to do is not to chase them but to identify where they're, they're storing these motorcycles. And we did a multitude of raids uh, last year taking those things into custody, uh, taking the motorcycles away from them and uh, trying to get them just basically destroyed. Now what I was told, and you have to tell me last year was a little better than the prior years. And, uh, and if, it, if it wasn't, then we'll retool. I just got this at the last meeting where uh, uh, I had the same complaint. So we're putting together another covert initiative because we're not able to chase them. So we chase these young teenagers or young kids or underage kids on these motorcycles. They run into a car and kill themselves and we're gonna, we, all, we have the liability. So we have to be, we have to be creative. And there's a, there's a couple different ways that we can go, go at this thing. We're gonna do the covert part where we're gonna find out where they're storing these, these motorcycles. We're gonna do search warrants, we're gonna take them into custody. Um, uh, whoever's organizing these things in uh, social media, we're gonna look at a different way of how they're starting to, to talk to each other in the conspiracy to bring people together and, and work with the state's attorney to see if we can address it that way. Uh, and then there's another creative part. And I don't know if we're able to even make this happen. If we can take that creative energy from these young people and uh, use it uh, in a positive way, uh, the problem, and I had to deal with this same similar type, it was cars someplace else uh, that I addressed, but what we talked about is maybe identifying a place where they can, uh, they can use the motorcycles in the proper way, use safety tools away from the middle of the street, but the problem with that is that nobody wants to take on that insurance liability, and so that's what you run into. I think we can find locations but to, to put these kids out there on the dirt and teach them how to do dirt bike riding and do it properly, you have to have somebody ensure if the kids get hurt out there. And nobody's willing to step up to do that. So uh, I haven't finished with that piece. We're going to go at it on the covert place. We're going to deal with it, uh, even addressing the social media and people organizing it. We may even start looking at addressing uh, the parents uh, that allow this to take place to put some pressure there. And then we may try to, to move on the proactive piece and see if we can address it. So we're going to hit it on a lot of different levels. Okay, yes, sir. Yeah. Next to Christian, just one second. One second, everyone, before we go on. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't cut you off. Ma I mean, I don't, I don't need to add to it. We're, we're on the same page. The, the problem with the, the and, and we've looked into this councilwoman inspector, looked at, into it, I know uh, Milton, and I know uh, Scott, about the, the, you know, having a potential place, but the issue in Baltimore is it's not that there's not a space to do it, it's that it's not, the, the issue is, riding to, to the street. And once you establish a place in the city where uh, they can ride, anybody you see on the street is riding to that spot, right? And so that's the, the you know, then that becomes the, the, the challenge. You know, I've been taking a look, one of the things that we did, uh, that I talked about in the state of the, the city address was uh, increasing, significantly increasing the reward money for anybody that turns in someone that has an illegal gun, a working illegal gun. You know, one of the things that uh, that I'm thinking about as, you know, some of the ideas we, you know, we try to take something out of every one of these meetings. So maybe it is increasing the reward money that's available for people who turn in uh, someone with a dirt bike. They're going somewhere. They're not dropping out of the sky on Sunday at 8.30. They're coming from somewhere and they're coming from homes in Baltimore. And if we're seeing it, and not saying something, then we're all responsible for it. So I'm gonna to continue to look for ways to create the incentives for people to turn them in. Okay, I'm gonna ask that, because there are many hands, and there are folks that are, I'm sorry. 
all primarily non-white people with his Under Armour. Can we approach him and maybe get him to donate a little money so that these kids have a place to ride instead of always having to punish, punish, punish? Can we get some of these folks at the very top, the 1%, to have it, see it in their hearts to donate to help these kids have something to do? Because obviously government doesn't have the money. I don't know what's happening to all of it. Thank but you. But I mean, come on. So as I said to the commissioner earlier, unfortunately, unless you have a microphone, your audio does not go to the camera. So I'm going to go to Christian Song, liaison of the Central District, who has a question from the gentleman sitting next to him. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, I have, my name is Dixon. I'm with the Park Heights Community Council. I have one question for the commissioner and one question for the mayor. Uh, commissioner Batts, um, I'm wondering why the uh, police, I live in the Park Heights area, just below Pimlico Racetrack, which is a heavy drug trafficking area. But um, I wonder why the police doesn't use all of its tools in fighting against drug trafficking, namely uh, surveillance, either through uh, cameras or um, you know some other means. Uh, why you don't use undercover police agents to make drug buys and make arrests? Why do, don't you use drug sniffing dogs because they hide the drugs in in um, vacant houses, grasses, and so forth? And um, I just want to get some feedback from you as to how you, would you uh, use your tools, all your tools, to combat this, this problem. Your question. Qu qu yes, sir, please go with the question with the mayor. Uh, yes, sir. Mayor, uh, uh, mayor yes. Um, the uh, street repair program, um, which has been going on, I guess, for 20 years, the, the streets are still not repaired. But what really concerns me is that I've seen streets that we thought were repaired, they came in and resurfaced the streets, and then six months later, 18 months later, they dig the same street back up again. Why, why is that uh, happening like that? I, I don't quite understand why they keep redigging the same streets up all over again. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. We have an answer from the commissioner, then to the, uh, to the mayor. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, um, I've been to uh, south of Pimlico multiple times, and many times. Um, uh, when I'm out on the street, I like to touch, feel, and see exactly what people are, are complaining about. Um, I've been over in the Jamaican area uh, that is just uh, just west of Pim Pimlico, and it has issues over there. I've had these young men come out there when I'm out there to show them what I'm looking at and see what their plans are, uh, how they're responding to it. So we are doing exactly that. What we have not brought to that area yet is the covert, the covert buys because we're, we were dealing with some more highly volatile situations where we had people dying in, in large numbers. Uh, you, you can see that uh, in the East Oliver community where we made significant impacts. In the Westerns, we, we've made significant impacts. So we've done that. Uh, we will be coming to your area uh, to make those impacts and to address, the, address those things long term. But you know that's dealing with a, a problem of addiction with using law enforcement to, to address that. Now we're gonna we're gonna do our part to to get that on balance, but I think the long term what we have to do is address the addiction that we have out there on the streets. One of the programs that Judge O'Malley works with, uh, which I would love to see expanded, uh, is drug court. Now drug court is is once that we arrest uh, the people instead of sending them to jail, they're in there for a short amount of time, then they come out and they're back on the streets again. Then we start that cycle again. We go out there, we arrest them, put them back in jail, then they're back on the streets. Gr drug court has a a um, reliability of somewhere close to about 90 to 95%. People who stay with that program and graduate uh, usually don't recidivate, recidivate. They don't get in trouble again. <laughs> Recidivist. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, and so what I like to do is do more of those long range positive programs that way. What are you laughing at, Captain? I know it's how to stay recidivist. <laughs> Uh, and to address the problem that way. So I want to be a little smarter about what we do, not just arrest, not just take them off the street, but make sure they don't come back after we've done that. And so we'd like to move in in that direction. Short term, a Major, would you all address exactly what you guys have been doing out there in the initiative about taking back our public spaces? Okay, so if you look at the strategic plan, one of the, uh, one of the tenets of the strategic plan is taking back public spaces. 
So the captain and I talked, and uh, along the lines of what the commission is doing in terms of the three C's, we have three E's. So the one is to, uh, to engage the community, right? The second one is to educate. Educate the, the individuals that are in that area about what we're gonna tolerate and what we're not gonna tolerate. And then the last one is to, uh, to look at our effectiveness, to make sure that what we're doing is working. Uh, so the number of things that we're doing, we're cleaning up in that area. Uh, the area right behind that 5100 block of Park Heights, where, uh, where that parking lot is, they used to call it the pan yard, where you had individuals who were back there drinking and things of that nature. We've cleaned that up. We're not doing that anymore. So the area right next to that where it's overgrown, uh, we've called into the city services to come and clean that up, repair that fence. Uh, the vacant houses that are around there, we want those boarded up and something done with them later on. So the whole idea of taking back that 5100 block of Park Heights is extremely important to us. Um, I, can, I was talking to the captain earlier. I can remember back when my grandfather took me to Cinderella's to get my first pair of Nikes, right? The, the white ones with the red swoop on them. So I'm, I'm, trying, to get, I'm trying to get us to that, uh, to that point where people feel comfortable to do that again. And little kids, when they grow up, they can have that memory of going to the 5100 block of Park Heights and, and, and buying there buying local and not having to travel a long, long way to get groceries and things of that nature. So I, I don't want to get us back to where we were. I want to get us past where we were to a point where, where we're all comfortable and that becomes a viable part of the community again. And, and the whole, the, the liquor stores and, and things of that nature are not the, the mainstay in the area, but viable places where we can do business. Thank you, Major. So I just want to briefly talk, thank, yes, thank you, Major, mm -hmm. and to Mr. Dixon's point. Uh, one of the things that, uh, I'll deal with the street, the street cut area. To, uh, one of the things that I've done is really try to use the city stop pro, uh, process to better coordinate when we needed to cut in the street. Uh, you know, sometimes you can repair a street and you never know, uh, you, you don't have an idea of what happens, um, if, if what's going to happen. You know, so if there's a, a water repair that needs to be done, that needs to go through that street, you know, Mother Nature doesn't care that we just, uh, you know, we just paved it. So we have to be, we have to respond to that. But when we know ahead of time that we we need to make cuts in the street, that's what I've worked to, uh, to, to enhance that coordination so we don't uh, make those cuts, uh, you know, to, to, to do the work over and over again. And we've increased uh, and enhanced that coordination. Additionally, with respect to street uh, pave, uh, repaving, uh, one of the things I'm really proud about is in the process of trying to uh, you know, cut down on the, the number of outside contractors we have and give more opportunities for Baltimore City residents. We brought a lot of the street repaving in-house. And uh, we have these big machines that uh, Baltimore City workers use to, to very effectively and efficiently um, pave our streets. And we've been able to, to pave more lane miles uh, than in recent years because of that, and I'm really proud of that. And one thing I, I want to add to uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Scott's um, question about cleaning is uh, one of, another way that uh, I'm uh, certainly working to enhance the cleanliness of this neighborhood and the entire city is the introduction of citywide street sweeping uh, in our neighborhoods. And my hope is, and it's not, it, it didn't get the way it is overnight, it's not going to be fixed overnight, but I think over time, having that consistent neighborhood street sweeping, it will help and, and, and support all of these other strategies that we're having about trying to change behaviors will be enhanced with that citywide street sweeping. And, we'll, and my hope is that we'll, 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 we will see progress. Thank you, Madam Mayor. There's a young lady here with the mic. I'm gonna ask Christian if he would, the lady in front of you, Christian, is holding up her cane, will be after the lady in the purple. Julius is going to have a conniption if I don't go. But there's a gentleman in front of you, Julius, for the sake of time. Yes, ma'am. You, and then we will go to Christian, and then we'll come back to the side of her. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just like to introduce myself as Pamela Curtis Massey, founder and owner of Pushing the Vision Outreach, and also host of Pushing the Vision Talk Radio, which is on Wednesdays from 2 to 3. Um, I just like to say that I have been living in the Northwest um, area community since the age of 15, since I would, was, was pretty much awarded to the state of Maryland, and I was in foster care. Um, so greatness can come from foster care. Um, and I do my best in connecting with the community by myself. So there's no excuse. And I, and I consider myself as one of the youngest community activists 
out here. Um, partnerships with Baltimore City, Breck and Hawks, setting up programs that not only engage the, and pretty much educate, you know, and the young boys, the young girls, but the community as a whole and families. And I had the pleasure of, um, of being selected by the mayor to have dinner with her for just to recognize the things that I have been doing in the community. And, and often we push blame on the mayor, we push blame on, on the commissioner. Um, but as for me, these have been the role models that have pushed me to be now 30 years old, a wife, a mother of two boys, and very active in my son's education without any excuses. But my question is, I just wanna say two, two places that people run for help when they stressed out or hurting or someone's after them are law enforcement and the church. Where are our pastors? And then how can we bridge that gap, bridge that gap um, from, from the police department and also the church where people run to when they need help? Where are our pastors? We may have one or two, but where are our known pastors that people run to for help when they cry, when they lay it out in the spirit of the church. Where are our pastors? We have to have to call them out because I'll be honest, y'all doing, excuse me, but y'all doing a damn good job um, in law enforcement. And I'm not saying that because I'm partnered with all not police <clears throat> districts, but I'm saying y'all are who I see. Y'all, y'all who I can call to talk to, to come speak to um, a group of people, the mayor, has an open door policy. She's, believe it or not, she's easy to engage even before I met you. Um, but when it's come to the church, you, you have to talk to this deacon, that minister, that this elder, but you never see them. It's time for us to engage the church and the police department. What can we do? Thank you for your question. I'm, Madam Mayor, if I could just get the question also from the lady. Yes, ma'am. Christian, you want to give her? an opportunity to ask a question. I'm trying to get the questions in so we can get a response. No, sir, with the cane. She was holding her cane up. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Madam Mayor. And I want to tell you one thing. I'm Ella Scovins. I'm chaplain of Hilltop 4100. I'm 74 years old. I would like to say kudos to the police department at Northwest Police Station. They have been very vigilant coming to our meetings, paying attention to our needs in the community. What we do, we have paper, we write it down, or we go outside. And I have noticed a vast change and the black car. And so when I, <laughs> when I see them in the alleys, I know I'm no longer afraid. And we had an incident up in the area, and it was very, um, it was very reassuring for a senior like me. I like to walk sometimes, but sometimes it get dangerous and I don't do that. But it's very reassuring to see them in the community, highly active, and then responding to us. I know you all do not have an easy job, but we should give credit where credit is due. God bless us when we do things. And now my question is to uh, you, Madam Mayor. I was wondering and sitting and talking to some of my grandchildren and their other uh, seniors in my church, we meet every Wednesday at Gospel Tabernacle Baptist Church. And the question that came up about jobs year round for students. Um, when I was in school, which I came out a long time ago, 57, and when I was in school, we had guidance counselors, we got jobs, there were provision, and this was like an active part along with the school. So have uh, the city, have the city uh, thought about coming around and maybe partnership with the school and see what they can do about jobs. Maybe starting in September, and I know this, this, uh, the job for the kids closed down in March, and then maybe go all through. Maybe it need to be a priority. Maybe you need to rethink how you need to do this. And if you need volunteers, there's plenty of us seniors that are willing to do that. Thank you very much, Ms. Govins. Can I answer the question? All right, uh, to the, to the uh, youth employment, that's a, that is a priority of mine. 
Uh, even when the, the federal money dried up for our youth works program, I made sure that we found resources so that we could uh, keep the same number of uh, kids in employed and we worked very hard to, to uh, provide uh, the city funds, but also knowing that the city can't do it alone, worked extremely hard to create partnerships with private entities to provide young people other opportunities. So there was a diversity in what we were able to uh, provide for our young people. Uh, so we have an initiative, not just YouthWorks, but as a part of it, it's Hire One Youth, where we encourage local businesses to hire just one person, just one young person. And out of that, uh, and out of that initiative, uh, we have been able to uh, place our young people in year-round employment uh, opportunities. We have been able to uh, allow young people to, uh, you know, to provide, to, to save money for school, to pay for their clothes, to pay for their books while they're in uh, school because of these opportunities. So yes, they, uh, they do exist. If you know of someone that is willing to hire a young person year-round, please go to the Mayor's Office of Employment Development uh, Karen Sidnick runs it. She runs our. Uh, she is. She oversees the Hire One Youth Initiative. Please connect that person with us. We, we have a program that prepares young people for uh, the work opportunity. That that teaches them the soft skills that they need to be able to to uh, to keep a job. We we have young people that want those opportunities. What we need is more businesses that are. Um, that are willing to hire. So anybody in here, Ms. Uh, Scovins, or anybody else in here that knows of a business that is, is willing to hire a young person, please, please, please connect them with um, the Mayor's Office of Employment uh, Development. And, and, and thank you, uh, Ms. Curtis Massey, for being here, for bringing your family, for being an active uh, member in the, the community, and for being an uh, inspired to inspire Women's History Month uh, uh, winner. I had a lovely time with you and, and the other women who uh, really recharge my batteries uh, when I see how uh, hard you're working. I will say that I, I too believe that it, in order for us to be a safer, it does take that partnership with the community. It does take the members of the, the faith uh, community uh, and that I, I believe just like there's all there's room for my administration for me to improve the administration to improve this there is certainly room for improvement uh, in the faith community uh, that being said I do want to say that out of all of the districts in the city uh, there's a, uh, a, a big push in uh, this community for uh, engagement from the faith leaders whether it's the the Jewish faith leaders who have a, a relentless commitment to uh, public safety as well as you know one the I mean the the uh, major and the captain can attest that the reason why you can use the front door for Northwest is because um, Bishop uh, Bishop Thomas and new psalmist raised money so they could open so they could uh, open the front door so um, I, I I agree that in order for us to be safer we have to create those links um, I also know that, uh, and, and yes, we have room for improvement, but you know, I want to also want to give credit where, where credit is due. I think we have a, a strong foundation in this district, um, and you know, we have a foundation to grow on to strengthen those relationships. Yes, sir. Now, let me just remind everyone, we are well over time, and Councilwoman Specter will, will attest to that. Uh, and the JCC has allowed us to have this room for a designated amount of time. And I want to respect their, uh, uh, certainly respect their agreement to host it tonight. So I just want to make it real quick. Julius, since you had your hand up and you didn't move five times, I'm going to let the gentleman ask this question. And hopefully, Julius, you can ask the question. I'll hand it back over to the man. Yes, sir. Uh, hello. My name is uh, Shimon Matiar. Uh, I have two questions, one from the commissioner and one for Madame Mayor. Um, I'm a student, a yeshiva student here in Baltimore, um, not from town, and I'm representing another student. He's a victim, and um, speaking on behalf of him. Uh, basically, what happened was, maybe about six months ago, uh, he was uh, walking down the street on a Saturday night, and a, cu uh, a couple of teenagers were walking down as well, and he was minding his own business, you know, just walking down the path, and they started shooting at him with a BB gun. And you know, he didn't have enough time to look to see you know, how many males or females were there. You know, it was a whole group. And he just immediately, immediately started running. And one BB gun got lodged, a metal BB got lodged into his ear. Pretty horrible, yes. And um, you know, he went into the room, I'm very close to him, he was crying, he was very, very shaken. 
we uh, called the police. The police came by and they, and we gave them a quick, you know, a very good description of who was there. The police went out, you know, looking for this group, and they called back and they said, oh, "We see a group, and we see that one of them has a BB gun, you know, but how many people are in this group?" So the guy said, "Look, you know, how in the world am I supposed to know how many people were there? I was running pell mell. You know, how am I supposed to know how many people are in this group?" So he just made it. He he, he said a number that, that he remembered, maybe, maybe six people. Police officer told him, I'm sorry, that's the wrong number. You have no proof. I, 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 can't, I can't take them to the police station. And he let him go, just like that. So you know, I have two questions that are, you know, first of all, for the commissioner. You know, how can uh, you, know, you allow, you know, how can we be comfortable as new students you know, studying here in Baltimore, knowing that you know, the police force is very involved with everything that's going on, judging from what I'm hearing from this entire forum, how can we, how can we be comfortable knowing you know, that you guys are uh, giving us an air of security and that you're making sure that everything is running smoothly when, so, when something like this happened. It doesn't seem like it made a good uh, first impression. And second of all, for the mayor, uh, we request as a, as, as a group, and I'm sure, you know, many other groups would appreciate, you know, if you can host seminars, you know, about, about safety, you know, to many colleges, to many, you know, private uh, new establishments that have opened to speak about safety and how important it is for students that are unaware of what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think that the first answer to your question is if I was in your shoes, I would not be happy with that response. Uh, and because I represent this organization, I am clearly not happy with that response, uh, nor do I tolerate something along those lines. Uh, so I'll, I apologize for the lack of service that my organization uh, had supplied to you and apologize to your friend too that was impacted. Uh, what I, I'd like to do is get your information uh, because I want to go back and look at the record of what officer went out there. Uh, we can track that down and whether I have to discipline the officer or teach the officer because we have a lot of young officers out there and that sounds like something a young officer would say uh, that lacks experience so I have to retrain them and that's just a purely unacceptable period bottom line. I'm not going to make an excuse, an excuse for it but uh, we will address it and follow up. The captain uh, um, Conway will contact you so we can follow up to find what officer that was and make sure that the next resident that has any similar, hopefully we don't have any similar, we don't ask uh, silly questions like that and that uh, we get better service. And with respect to the public safety forum, I would a ask that Council Inspector take the lead on making sure that we coordinate with the schools. Thank you. And we'll work with you th through you, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, please. Oh, thank Julius. You. Thank you. I said um, Go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, My name is Julius Colon. I'm the president and CEO of Park Heights Renaissance. I have a uh, two-part question for the commissioner and one um, for, the, um, uh, for the mayor. Um, commissioner, we have, uh, I'd like to, first I want to compliment uh, the Northwest, uh, again, um, uh, police for the great work they do when it even comes to the issue of dividing lines, northern and northwest that they actually go past into the Northern District and work in the Northern District. We have a, a built a new building over at um, Pimlico and um, in Borman, and that's a dividing line between Northern and Northwest, and Northwest has gone in and helped us because somebody's been, had a BB gun around there shooting some of the another windows. Oh. I'm sorry, another BB gun yes. issue. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, but, um, we have a Safe Streets program in Park Heights. I'd like to know your opinion of the Safe Streets program and whether you are considering at all any opportunity to reinstate the PAL or some design of PAL to deal with our youth population. And um, Mayor, we uh, transformed Baltimore with your administration um, has been uh, very successful with respect to uh, working on to, with transform Baltimore to changing some of the zoning. And one of the real issues that we have is with the whole uh, liquor establishments. We know south of um, Northern Parkway, there's a lot of um, uh, liquor establishments, the high density, and a lot of the crime centers around that. However, we have a real problem in council, in the city council, that the opportunity to pass the liquor legislation may not happen. And I'm really concerned about that, Madam Mayor, that that would not, that, certain council members would not go ahead and actually pass this legislation for whatever reason. It's not about business rights, it's about human rights. So, Julius, I want to say I've, I've been on record with uh, supporting the, the reduction and proliferation of liquor licenses in the city. I've been very clear. The reason why the issue is uh, being discussed in the council is because my administration has pushed 
uh, push this. So I've, I've, I've been abundantly clear uh, that, that I agree with you. With respect to the, uh, I'll take, I don't know, want to make sure I, we get the uh, right information on the, the PAL centers. You know, the, the PAL center was a model that uh, under the previous administration had, had ended. Um, and uh, one of the things that I know is that if you can you can do what the PAL centers were intended without those centers. You can incorporate that uh, that model uh, without having the PAL centers. I'm, I am uh, convinced uh, that by listening to the community community on what they want to see as a future future of recreation and parks and recreation centers, uh, we can uh, throughout the city build. The, uh, the, the types of recreation centers that will uh, support the community and, and, and that uh, community members want to use of all ages. And that's the goal. Uh, the commissioner has made it very clear that he wants his police officers to participate in, in, um, in those centers as well as in other ways to uh, build relationships with young people. So um, the, the, the point of PAL was to, to create positive relationships uh, between the police and young people, as well as to give young people an opportunity to um, have recreational opportunities. And, and we, I believe, and the commissioner believes in getting those um, through the avenues that we have established currently. Real quick, Madam Mayor, we have a young lady, a young person who had a hand up. Was you going cut to ask me off. I didn't get a chance to answer his question, Gus. No, sir. You're going to ask a question, okay. commissioner. I just want to make sure that we acknowledge her. No, not yet, young lady. Just wanted to point you out. Yes, sir. <laughs> Adam, my my, uh, my answers are very very uh, short. Thank you for applauding, and it's good to hear that the residents feel that the command staff and officers are doing a good job. That is good to hear, and I sincerely appreciate that feedback. One of the things that I saw when I walked in the doors, a lot of our crimes were between our border lines, uh, and it was, it was between all the districts, not, not just north and northeast, but northern and north northwest. Uh, also in, in north, north, northeast and eastern. So if you looked at crime within the city, they were all through with the borderlines. One of the things that uh, I told them is that this patch says Baltimore Police Department. It doesn't say northern, it doesn't say northwest, it says Baltimore. So what I expect them to do is work as a team to cross those lines. And so as you give me that feedback, I sincerely appreciate that they're doing it and going in the right direction. That's happening throughout the city, so we're starting to hear that more and more. I think safe streets, the way that we do it here in Baltimore, it takes away, if, if the, safe, the safe streets are people who used to be in the life who are now uh, working to help to turn, turn uh, the, the issues around. I think that's a counterintuitive um, program that works very well because if you have people who do the right things and step out and say, that's not the right thing to do, I think young people hear that shift and change and it has proven by empirical data if you do it correctly, it does in fact work. Uh, the only thing that we're trying to tweak is to make sure that we have a better relationship between us and safe streets that we share information that's going back and forth without jeopardizing them in any way. Young lady, you have been very patient. Your hand was up a while ago. Uh, here's your opportunity to pose your question. Please introduce yourself and present your question. Hi, my name is Naya Merchant and I currently attend the stadium school. I'm about to graduate and go to Dunbar and I was wondering what is in place for public school safety and my second question is, is there any opportunities for AM, for like students who are interested in being an EMT for EMT Lab? You say EM and EMT like the fire department? I'm sure the chief was happy to hear that. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Niles, Niles, don't run so fast, Niles. <laughs> I think we have a new recruit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm ready to give you a hug. I, I, let me tell you, if you heard earlier, if you heard earlier, one of the things that the mayor said was that we were trying to put together farm teams. My, my you know, I'm, I like metaphors as I get older. I like them more and more. But, I, you know, our, our baseball teams have minor league teams. I'm trying to do that on the level with some of the high schools. We actually have an EMT program, I believe, in Dunbar now. We have one in... Uh, Douglas as well, and we're looking at fire EMT in Douglas and fire EMT in, in Dunbar Ness as I think about it. But we're trying to do other schools. So you're going to the right place. So as soon as you hit the ground, they're asking them and tell them that you're interested in the programs that the fire chief said, you're coming to it. <laughs> With Thank you very much, Chief Moore. Don't touch my, my microphone again, Niles. <laughs> uh, and with respect, 
with respect to uh, safety, you know, one of the things that I expect uh, from the, the uh, police department in every district is to have a strong relationship with the, uh, the school police uh, to make sure that we're providing uh, seamless safety for our kids. Um, and uh, one of the ways that my, I hope that we check to see if we're doing that right was with the, uh, the youth public safety forum that I have scheduled next week. So I'll be hearing directly from students that's gonna be down at, at City Hall. So we can talk about ways that we can enhance that partnership between the uh, school police and the, the uh, police department. And as the mayor says that, we work very closely with the school police and we have a program that uh, we spend a lot of uh, resources on, uh, watching the ingress and egress routes that come in and going where students go. Uh, we put a lot of police officers before school starts and after school ends to make sure kids are coming and going in safe ways. So we continue to make sure that you're safe. You're, safe. you're our number one issue. If there's anything on campus, we come running and we come pretty fast. So your safety is uh, paramount for us. So we were complete uh, until Councilwoman Inspector raised her hand and certainly I can. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What I want to say is that I know want to say is I know that the mayor and the commissioner knows that they're lucky to have us but we are lucky to have you and we thank you very 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 much I just been asked to, to work again Northwest Community Relations Council Pat Rideout the fifth annual public safety day is Sunday June the 8th at the public safety training Academy that's at Northern Parkway and Park Heights Avenue from noon to four, bring the kids. It is really a wonderful experience, a family experience. I really encourage everyone to come. I come every year and I learn something and I'm amazed to see the families come and the kids enjoy all of the equipment. They get a chance to be with the cadets, be with the officers and test the equipment. It's wonderful. In answer to the young man's question, also this year we'll host a workshop. In answer to your question about safety, we're also holding workshops this year that will teach you how to identify someone who attacks you. It's the difference in the winter time when they have on them big coats, they might have a red string around their waist and the others have on yellow and orange. So there are things that we are bringing in this year that we have not had before. Homeland Security will be there, evacuations of how to get out of the city, but most important, for us to take care of ourselves and know what we're doing. So please come out. Last question. There's a gentleman who's been patient the entire night. I'll give you the question. Before you, before you ask your question, I know that I, I see other hands raised. If my, Many hands. Yeah, so um, I have some uh, Office of Neighborhood staff that are here. Can you keep your hands up? Do I have acknowledgement from my Office of Neighborhood staff that we're gonna, t we're gonna get those questions answered? We're good? I'm seeing everybody shaking their hands. All right, so don't don't leave without touch, touching base with one of the office of neighborhood staff. I, you know, there's never there's never going to be enough time to get to everything, but we do want to make sure that we get your question answered. So, um, thank you. We are like 30 minutes beyond the time because you were, you were patient and kind. I'll give you the last question. Thank sir. you, yes, sir. My name is Apostle Clarence M. Hooper. I also address the mayor and Commissioner Bass. Mr. Bass, I'm the one that wrote the letter about the trauma response team. Uh, the clergy wants to be a part of the trauma response team. We would like to have a meeting with you as soon as we can because we want to be a part of the trauma response team to help the police help out in the city. Uh, for the mayor, uh, my church is Holy Ghost Delivers Tabernacle Church. Around my area on 132 Willow Street, there are 29 vacant houses. Trees are falling into the house. I have tried numerous times to get those houses. I've been knocked down, knocked down, knocked down. But I'm not asking the city to let me buy the houses. I will personally tear down the houses myself and rebuild those houses up for transitional homes for the homeless. I have not heard nobody say a word about the homeless. The homeless is more important than everything else. And the thing of it is that I do not think that it's right. We have these forms 
but we got folks that are laying out on the street in yes. your doorways. Yes. And I can contest to this, before 5 o'clock, they are moved away from the city buildings because they don't want none of the big shots to see them land in the hallway. And that is not right. And I heard you say that you said it out your mouth that there is no contractors who want these houses. That is not true. I've been trying to get these houses for the longest, but y'all want too much money for a shell that nobody's going to give you for it. Now, you want to stop the homeless, we got the empty houses. All these empty houses that you got people going in doing drug deals, prostitutes in, but yet you got folks laying in the street, and we talking about the city supposed to be doing this, the city doing that. We talking about we ain't got money for this, but we can find money for junk, but we can't find money for the homeless. Thank you, sir. And I think that's a disgrace. Thank you. Pastor, I'd, I'd like to uh, start by answering your first question, and, and I'd like to applaud your service, and I'd like to applaud the passion of many people in here, and I think everybody's heart is in the right place trying to do something for our community, so I'd I like to say thank you and thank you for your passion. Uh, I've been working with uh, the clergy for years upon years. Uh, I think I just signed a document supporting uh, your program. Uh, uh, today, as a matter of fact, I just sent that in. Thank you, uh, you can have a meeting with me anytime that you want. The only thing I ask is that you forgive me that I didn't make it to church on Sunday. I apologize. But anytime you want to come in, I'm available. Sir, I'll be talking with you after yes, me. Yes, Thank you, sir. And, Pastor, I'll make sure that you get connected with a few things. One, um, I'm, I, I'm not sure where you heard me say that there weren't anybody interested in it. You said it on TV. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I have talked about is my Vegas to Value initiative, which has put more, um, has, 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 has spurred more private investment uh, in vacant homes and through incentive have put more people in, uh, in the, the vacant homes than at least the, the past administration, probably the past two. I've been very focused on um, a, a a program that works for city, the, the city that, that has been tearing, we've been tearing down more houses than it's been done before and creating uh, a significant amount of investment. We've gotten national and international uh, acclaim for uh, the program. So I'm not, I, I'm, I am not sure um, what you thought I was talking about because all I talk about is the, the ability that my administration has had connecting with people who are interested in those homes. So I wanna make sure um, before you leave, you get connected with the right person, as well as with my um, off, the Mayor's Office of Human Services, because I am uh, extremely committed to providing resources to homeless people. I, I also know that if we continue to, to think, have a mentality that it's a us against them or an either or, uh, it's not going to work. You can provide um, you can you can provide opportunities for people to have jobs. You can provide. Um, opportunities for investors to, um, you know, to redevelop homes, and you can help uh, the homeless. You have to, in order, in order for all of us to move uh, to to progress, we have. To, I believe, um, you know, we're all in this t together. So I um, have been very uh, aggressive uh, with our Journey Home Initiative, a housing first model, working with the federal government on uh, housing vouchers, working to make sure that we provide opportunities. Uh, working with um, in, individuals with um, yeah, particularly bitter, veterans to make sure that we reduce the number of homeless veterans. So I want to make sure that you get connected with um, our executive director for the for the journey home, so you can um, ask some uh, ask get specific information about what we're doing. And after hearing that, if you think that there are ways that we could do better, please please share them. Thank you. And the mayor had asked me last week to uh, meet with uh, Commissioner Graziano on vacants to values and so just to today we we're having that same conversation that you just brought up today earlier at the direction of the mayor so i think we we're looking at that citywide part of what we're trying to address is come up with a a good cataloging in the, in the locations that are most problematic for us and that we're working together to address those uh, very quick madam mayor you have the last word i just want to i again want to reiterate i know everybody's question wasn't answered i want to thank everyone for your patience i want to thank the uh, jcc for their indulgence of time i know that we were supposed to be out of here an hour ago um so i want to thank uh, them for that and again just to to recommit and make sure that the office of neighborhoods employees if if you have a question please don't uh you know don't leave before you get connected with one of my uh, mayor's office and neighborhood employees so we can get uh, your question answered. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. 
um, you know, this is an ongoing conversation. I appreciate your commitment to uh, your community and your willingness to work with us for a safer Baltimore. Thank you.